thanks for coming tonight. I'm Sylvia Shulkin. I'm the first vice president of the League of Women Voters of Falmouth and chairman of the steering committee, which kind of oversees things for our local chapter. We generally begin our monthly meeting with the following reminder to our membership, and it's an advertisement to the community at large, and it bears repeating. The League of Women Voters is that rare organization that's a nonpartisan political organization of men and women, and it will soon be celebrating its 100th birthday. Our plans, of course, are a secret. But you'll be hearing about it. We're nonpartisan because we never support a political party or candidate. We're political because we do take stands on public policy issues, but only after we study the issues, discuss them, and come to a consensus as a group. The League encourages informed and active participation in government and it works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. We also influence public policy through education and advocacy. And tonight's program is one of the best examples of what the League does to promote informed, active participation in government. The League of Women Voters lobbied very hard for a law that promotes civics education and civic engagement. League members called, wrote, testified, and spoke directly to our legislators. Now that the law has passed, we're collaborating with the people in Falmouth who know most about civics education in this town. And they will give you information about the law. You will hear from the administration and staff of the Falmouth Public School System who are going to be implementing the law, the students who are the intended beneficiaries of the law, and from State Representative David Vieira, who has made civics education a legislative priority. And I want to recognize that uh, Senator Vinny DiMacito, who's our state senator, is also here tonight. Many thanks to Judy Ziss, who's chair of the League's Legislative Committee, and to her very hardworking cohorts, Margaret Cooper, Penny Doobie, Mary Matucci, Cynthia Rankin, and Kerry Walton. Thank you for presenting this program. A lot of hard work goes into these programs, although we hope they often come off seamlessly and you don't realize what we've done behind the scenes. It's now my pleasure to introduce you, Judy Ziss. Sylvia, can you hear me? Um, thank you very, very much for that introduction. Um, and I want to welcome everybody here. Um, this is something that's being done with, in collaboration with the Falmouth Public Schools. They've been very enthusiastic about it, and we're delighted that they're as enthusiastic as we are. Um, it's also being filmed, as you can see, by uh, um, <coughs> FCTV. And, um, we will expect that we'll have a chance to hear at least briefly from David Vieira, who helped write the law. And um, as, uh, <coughs> as Sylvia said, um, we're honored that uh, Senator DeMacito um, has come as well. This law was passed um, in late 2018. I think I have to do something about the law of gravity here, but anyway. Um, this is it. It's not all that long, and it's called an act to promote and enhance civic engagement. Now, you're going to be hearing about the, the parts of the law that will be implemented by the schools here. Um, it's, this is to give the schools an opportunity to share with you the progress of their plans to enhance their already robust civics education program. And their plans are not complete, it's a work in progress, so what you're really going to get is a snapshot of, um, of their thinking at the present time. And we have faculty members, we have administrators, and we're going to have, we're so happy, we have two students here too. So you'll be hearing from them later. Um, now you found a handout on your seat, and the purpose of that is just to put the portion of the law that the um,
thank you, thank you. <laughs> I think it's still, I think the law of gravity is still here though. But um, anyway, you'll, uh, hopefully you will be able to see from the handout the way the, the portion of the law that the schools are gonna be talking about fits into the law as a whole. And I just wanna mention a little bit about actually, it's, it's the part that's, t that's mentioned at the bottom of the handout, but it's really the beginning of the law. The first two pages set up something called the Civics Project Trust Fund. You know, you always, whatever you do, you always need money to help do it. And one of the things that um, is important is having um, funds for professional development. Another one is there's an idea of having a program for the eighth grade. The eighth, you'll hear the eighth graders are going to have a special, a special um, project. And the idea is in a couple of years, they'll have a statewide program where the eighth graders can go and showcase their project. My daughter was always in science fairs and I can kind of see this, like, this seems like a science fair for civics and I think that's, that's just great. Um, there is a group and the league is, uh, a part of that group, it's, there's some brochures in the back of the room, but they're trying to get 1 million point five for um, funding for this trust fund. My understanding is the governor's budget, although the governor signed the, the legislation, he did not include any money for the trust fund. So this is our job now, to lobby for money for the trust fund, and I've given you some information on the handout. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the chairs of the Ways and Means Committees, there's a joint committee in, in our legislature, they're both new, so I think they're just getting their sea legs. I'm not sure they're ready to have us barrage them yet, but you can start barraging them anyway. Um, and you have the information for our three legislators, two of whom are here, and my sense is that all of them will support funding this trust fund. Um, so when you go home, I hope you'll make some phone calls. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to the um, superintendent of schools office and Dr. Sonia, um, now I'm spelling, pronouncing it right, <laughs> tell you, right? Um, Assistant superintendent of schools here in Falmouth and let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> So thank you again to Judy and to the League of Women Voters of Falmouth for inviting us. Uh, Judy called our office a couple months ago on a morning and left a message and we reached back out and we started a conversation uh, that led to a face-to-face -face meeting that really led to some really good energy about the connections between the work that the League is concentrated on and the work that uh, we've been charged with in terms of amplifying our instruction. So we're really excited to share with you this evening uh, both the work that's ongoing and some of the future work that's planned. Uh, I'm very thankful to see some familiar faces as well in the audience, members of our school committee, members of our school staff and leadership. Um, we have two students joining us this evening and I saw some parents out there too. So um, thank you to everybody. Um, really quickly before I get into the overview of our presentation, I just wanted to call out uh, Mr. Mike Feeney is seated at the front table. He's our social studies department head for grades seven through 12. Miss Anna Noble, uh, Anna Dunphy, I did her maiden name again, I'm sorry Anna. Um, Anna is the project manager to the Office of Teaching and Learning and a once and forever social studies teacher, so a major advocate for the work that we're doing. Also joined by Mr. James DC, who is both a social studies teacher at Lawrence School as well as the person who oversees our student government. And our student from eighth grade, Miss Alexia Morton, is a member of his student government at Lawrence School. And Ms. Michaela McCarthy is a graduating senior who's going to talk about her experiences uh, over her entire career here in Falmouth Public Schools with us. So just to orient you to the team with whom I'm here this evening, not our complete team, but certainly a representative team of our work. So thank you to all of you as well. So civics learning in the Falmouth Public Schools is certainly something that presents for us new opportunities. Uh, we'd be remiss if we said that it's something that was brand new for us. Um, we've worked hard and Anna's going to illustrate for you in a little bit the work we've done around the civics learning plan. But the renewal of the social studies framework really gives us a platform to accelerate some of the work that we had planned to do and amplify our community engagement. So uh, just by way of orientation, I have had uh, the honor and privilege this year to serve as one of Massachusetts Educational Policy Fellows. And last week I joined my uh, peers across the nation in Washington, D.C. 
and we listened to one of our plenary speakers who was Roscoe Jenkins, uh, excuse me, Roscoe Jones Sr., who was an advocate in the mid-60s as a high school student, and he could not tell us enough how the real heroes of civil rights are our students. And he was really clear about the mission that we have as K-12 educators to educate our students as the future's leaders in citizenry. I should also point out uh, this week, our superintendent, Dr. Lori Dorr, uh, was one of several members at our building who were able to have lunch with some of our elementary students. In particular, uh, this is a group of English language learners who were on a civics tour of the town of Falmouth. They had visited uh, Town Hall, the post office, the Falmouth Library, and then they came to visit us and share their stories. Um, and we exchanged uh, a couple of stories with them as well. So three key points that we want to call out in terms of our overarching goal. First and foremost is to build relationships. Part of that is building relationships internally between our teachers, our administrators, and our students. But the other part of that is building relationships with our community. And that's one of the steps that we're hoping this evening's presentation will help us to, to move forward with. Once we have those relationships, we have a common language. We can seek common ground. And then that'll enable us to start to have some deeper conversations about the impact that we can have on community initiatives and to help educate our students to be involved in those. And finally, making sure that we remain conscious of our role as the champions for our students, because again, our students are going to be our future leaders and citizens. And so at this point, I just want to share the operational definition of civic education that we use in our work. And it comes from the National Council for the Social Studies. In a constitutional democracy, productive civic engagement requires knowledge of the history, principles, and foundations of our American democracy and the ability to participate in civic and democratic processes. Civics enables students not only to study how others participate, but also to practice participating for themselves and taking informed action for themselves. And this is the touchstone to which we return as we make each of the decisions about how to move forward with the new curricular framework. And so to help us unpack the framework and to start to understand more about uh, the breadth of the law, I'd like to introduce Mr. Michael Feeney. Thank you very much, folks. This is a great opportunity for us to reach out to the Falmouth community and kind of give you an, an opportunity to kind of see what the law, the framework um, entails. So what we're going to do is kind of go through a few slides here and kind of break down some of the different grade levels and expectations. Um, we start here at pre-kindergarten, and it might seem kind of strange that there are frameworks in kindergarten. But when you look at a social studies framework, it's not just social studies, but ELA, math, all the different subjects. You go from pre-K all the way through high school. So I wanted to uh, make sure that you know, folks here realize that it starts really, really early. So pre-kindergarten, building a foundation of living and working together. And then kindergarten, many roles of living and working together. What you're seeing here is setting up different rules within a classroom, okay? How do we function together as kindergarten students along with their teacher, along with their peers? And then that basically builds on in terms of kindergarten, in terms of the different uh, roles of living and working together. Grade one, leadership, cooperation, and unity and diversity, the meaning of citizenship. So in grade one, they ask kind of the big picture question is, you know, what does it mean to be a citizen? Even at grade one, they're starting that type of question. And they start breaking down in terms of how people participate in society. They talk about voting, for example. Grade two, and what you'll start to see once you get past grade one and grade two, you'll see one level more of a US-centric and then more of a global perspective. So in grade two, global geography, places and peoples and cultures and resources. So again, now you go and look at a worldview in grade two, jumping off from what they had in grade one. Grade three, Massachusetts, home to many different people. This is interesting where you actually have, with this revised curriculum uh, framework, specific standards towards Massachusetts history. 
Students are going to learn about indigenous populations that are central to Massachusetts. They also learn about important people within the, the state of Massachusetts, people like John Adams, for example. Um, and it's really centered on Massachusetts history, which is pretty exciting when you think about it for kids to understand what's going on in their own state. Grade four, North American Geography and History and in Peoples. Again, you have a US kind of centered course and then you move to a grade four more global perspective. Grade five, I know what you're seeing, because a lot of people wonder too. Uh, US history until the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. This is an overview. This is not um, you know, a college level class, uh, so to speak. However, if you do look at the frameworks, you'll see that this is a robust class. Um, this is something that folks are really getting their hands dirty in, in, in the frameworks, even at the fifth grade level. Um, you look at the US history again, the start in terms of the Civil War, I'm sorry, in terms of the American Revolution leading to the Civil War and then jumping to the Civil Rights Movement. Um, we've been talking as a department um, and just big picture, you know, how do we transition from Civil War to Civil Rights Movement? Grade six and seven, world, ge world geography and ancient civilizations, again, going back to a global perspective. And the reason why I put six and seven is the frameworks allow at the grade six and seven a opportunity for a collaboration between the two grades, and we're exploring ideas in terms of how to make that possible. Grade eight, United States and Massachusetts government and civic life. Um, if you wanted to kind of identify what's the crown jewel of the new frameworks, I think grade eight is. Um, this is what people have been really wanting. And if you actually look underneath, you have the MCAS and Civics Project. Something new. For example, grade eight teachers, students, for the first time, have the duality of project and an MCAS within the same year. Um, we don't know how this goes yet. Um, we're kind of you know, starting the process of, of putting our feelers out. Um, I'm part of a uh, social studies department head network, uh, Cape Wide. Uh, we actually meet tomorrow, where we'll start kind of having our first kind of brain trust is, you know, how do we approach this? Um, so what we're looking at, again, is a civics project that's part of the law that's tied at eighth grade, and then also um, a potential MCAS test tied to the civics curriculum. High school, United States history one and two and world history and electives and civics project. It's currently known, it's currently unknown if a state assessment will be introduced at the high school level. Um, right now, um, the Department of Education, they're kind of taking a one step at a time process, I think is the easiest way to explain it. Um, right now, what I know, what we all know is that grade eight seems to be the, the, the target group right now for the MCAS, um, and we're waiting to see what happens at the high school level. The overview of the law itself, the actor promotes civic engagement enacted by Governor Baker in November of 2018. There are several components to the law. You have civics projects, voter registration, and student representation on school committees. Students will engage in civics projects, one at the eighth grade and the other at the high school level. So what the law is calling for is two opportunities for the civics project. One at the eighth grade, specifically at the eighth grade, there was a lot of questions in terms of how you know, that works. Is it, does it have to be at eighth grade? Is it could be at sixth grade? But it's actually at the eighth grade. Um, one question that's coming up that I'm hoping to uh, find answers for is, there are some schools that are eight through 12. So how does that work? I'm not sure, um, but we'll find out. At this time, uh, Fountain High School students engage in senior projects, and that's something that one of our panel members will be telling you a little bit about um, in, a little bit, in a little while. In regards to the civics projects, civics projects must be nonpartisan. 
Civics projects may be individual, small group, or class-wide. Any student choosing not to work with a group as part of a class-wide project may work alone. If you look at the big picture and nature of this, of this language, um, I think it's intentional. What our legislators, when they created this law, is they want to make it to happen. So what they've done is they've allowed for as many different combinations to make it happen. So when you look at it, the individual group class-wide, um, we have a lot of different types of opportunities. So it should be interesting to see you know, what comes of this. Before I get into this slide, just kind of a, a short aside, when you, when you look at the, the law, when it was first announced in terms of the civic uh, projects, a lot of people kind of said, great, we're gonna bring our kids to the beach, we'll clean up the beach and that will wrap it up and then we're done. Um, and if you actually look at the components of the civics project, cleaning up Old Silver Beach isn't going to work here for this. Um, the projects will focus on analyzing complex issues, considering different points of view, making logical claims using valid evidence, engaging in civil discourse, demonstrating connections between federal, state, and local policies. So when you look at what a civics project encompasses, there's some meat to this. There's some work to be done here. Um, it's going to take us time to, you know, get it right, to figure out how do you create a project that encompasses all of these things. The Commonwealth Civics Challenge will be a showcase of projects throughout the state. Uh, I personally envision that this will probably take place at the Ted Kennedy Institute up in Boston. Um, that's my guess. Um, it could, you know, have different um, other areas that this could happen, but. Um, that's something that I think I envision that would happen there. The Voter Challenge Program. Right now at Fountain High School, in terms of registering students to vote, um, when we go through our graduation, graduation rehearsal for seniors, what ends up happening is after they receive their you know, practice diploma, they walk off the stage and they come around, and we have volunteers. Um, in, in the past, it's actually been... Uh, I know in the past uh, some women from the League of Women's Voters are helping them register to vote right then and there. So it's like, you graduated, now let's get ready to vote. Um, one of the other aspects of this law that we've been looking at too is the voter challenge. It's not just enough to do it that one shot deal. Um, I run the student government program at the high school and one of the things that I'm looking at is how can the student government program help in that effort? Um, there could be multiple um, voter drives. And we've actually seen some students um, work on that as part of their senior project too. Student representation on the local school committees and promote participation in municipal boards and, and committees. At this time, um, we have a student by the name of Zoriana Petrison, who's a freshman at Falmouth High School. And she has been our student liaison on the school committee. Um, she provides updates, um, she answers questions, sometimes she comes back and kind of digs for more information to report back out. And then of course the, the promote of participation uh, uh, within the municipal boards and, and committees. Um, part of the law is basically looking at the, the different communities and saying, hey, open up your doors, open up your committees, have kids participate. One of the things that I think is important in this though is it's, it's going to be important for us when we open our doors for kids to participate, to make it meaningful for them, um, to actually give them a voice, not just to kind of sit there and say you're here. Um, so that's something that, you know, all of us in terms of every town needs to look at and figure out how do we, how do, we do this effectively. Yes. Yes, so Zoriana is um, her, she's, a, she's the vice president of her class. And so she brings information back and we disseminate it. And now I'm going to turn it over to Miss Anna Dunphy. Sure. So to answer your question, um, 
they are in different schools, but however, it's, it's an exchanging of ideas of curriculum. They won't necessarily be teaching together. And just to assure everyone, we're gonna have a question and answer session at the end of the panel discussion as well. So if anyone has any questions, definitely we can um, make sure that they're all addressed. Uh, so obviously there are just so many new opportunities available to the district as a result of the framework and also the new law. But it, even prior to this work being started, the district was taking a really deep dive look at what civic opportunities were available to our students. So I just wanna go over some of those opportunities with you. The document that was created is entitled the Civic Learning Plan and it's available on the Office of Teaching and Learning website for Falmouth Public Schools. Uh, again, just bringing it back to these bigger ideas about why civic engagement is so important for our students. The piece for the civic learning plan is really about student participation. So it's not just about civic knowledge, it's also about how, this, how our students are engaging with their communities. The civic learning plan was developed in 2015 in response to collaboration, collaborative discussions between the school district and the Falmouth League of Women Voters. It was an opportunity for the district to capture holistically what was being taught in terms of civic skills and standards in our schools from all the way from pre-K to grade 12. What we discovered was really twofold, that first and foremost, all of the civic standards and skills were being addressed in our classrooms. Just some examples of these. So, and I'm, right now I'm speaking about the previously adopted frameworks, but of course now that they're even more robust, this is still going to exist in all of our classrooms. For example, in grade one, students would learn national songs. They would read stories about famous Americans. Then you jump up to grade five, students are learning about the first American colonies and founding principles of our democracy. And then this is gonna go all the way up to Falmouth High School where students build upon these understandings and discover how the principles manifest in our current system of government, all the way from federal, state, and at the local level. The plan, um, if you take a look at it, it's a long document, um, but it really articulates how all of those standards are captured at each grade level. But then we also kind of going on these tours of all the schools and buildings and seeing where this learning is taking place, we realized that the learning wasn't just happening in our social studies classrooms. Our students were getting all of these really rich experiences about how to be a citizen, how to participate in their government. And as you can see from the Mullen Hall student government, this was happening in the earliest grades in our schools. So it was really exciting and it was a pleasure to see for those of us who got to tour the schools and see all this great work. Our teachers were really making government participation come alive. As part of the process of creating the plan, I met with a lot of different teachers. One of the things that I was just incredibly impressed with was going to the Lawrence School and seeing their town meeting. It was just an exciting time. Students were enthusiastic in their participation. They were creating proposals for new ideas for the school and trying to garner support from their classmates. As an early introduction to what government participation looks like in practice, the students were experiencing a very authentic form of government participation. In addition, um, going up to the high school level, just having those model UN experiences as well. So everything was building on one another from a very early age all the way up until high school. In addition to those experiences, again, the civics learning plan, if you have a chance to take a look at it, it's really um, a very comprehensive glimpse of what's going on in our schools. But there are a lot of other experiences as well. The Lawrence School Exploratory Period lets students take a deep dive if they um, are spending additional time looking at social studies topics. Uh, Mr. Feeney already commented on voter registration opportunities that are available at the high school. We also have interdisciplinary programs, again, just highlighting that all of this learning is not just happening in the social studies classrooms, but it's happening throughout all of our different subjects that are taught at every grade level. These are opportunities for students to go out and support members of their community. Sometimes it's through, um, through their art learning, it's their projects, it's their music. 
there are just lots of different ways that that's happening. And then one other thing that I did want to mention is that the civic learning plan was created to align with other district initiatives and documents. So these include our plans for accreditation, it's our strategic plan, it's the mission statements of the schools. This is all flowing into one another so that our civic learning is supporting all of the other learning in the district and vice versa. Lastly, just uh, this was a collaborative document and it's a living document. It was most recently updated in January and obviously based on all of these important discussions we're having tonight, it's just going to get even longer. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's a pleasure to capture all of those experiences. So as these opportunities continue to grow, we're just going to continue to grow the document. Um, obviously, this was developed in 2015 and it's still going so many many thanks to the social studies department who've taken lots of time to talk about what they do but thank you to all of our staff who's taken the time to speak with us about those opportunities and now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Tellier for the panel discussion So thank you again to Mike and Anna. And just um, as other members of our panel come up to the table to join us uh, with smiling faces, which you will see momentarily. Um, one of the other things that I just wanted to point out around the piece that Anna mentioned in the Civics Learning Plan, for the process of accreditation at our high school, one of the things that we are asked very explicitly to do is to design our academic expectations our social expectations, and our civic expectations for each graduate. And so one of the things that we were trying to help the high school figure out when we were designing the civics learning plan was how to assess and measure students' civic education. And that was one of the reasons uh, that when Anna talked about the findings from the work being uh, twofold, I, I think it was probably three or fourfold, um, but also the fact that many of our grades, even if they weren't social studies grades, when we were looking at English grades, uh, science grades, in some cases uh, elective uh, student grades, we were already measuring their, their impact in civic learning. And then looking at their opportunities outside of the classroom, as Anna illustrated, allowed us to also sort of see that impact on a much broader scale when it wasn't limited to 5, 10, 20 students, but we were offering a number of opportunities and so initially, Anna had uh, interviewed one of our high school guidance counselors because we had what was called the Civic Leadership Project that was meeting after school. And it's now grown, and it's now a collaboration with the Rotary Club, uh, and it's the Interact Club for students after school and promoting their leadership as well as their civic involvement. So um, thank you again to Mike and Anna for sharing that information. And now welcome to Alexia, to Mr. GC, and to Michaela, who have joined our panel as well. So here they are, our panelists. So I have a few questions that I'd like to ask before we turn the floor over to an open question and answer. And actually, the first uh, question is for our two student panelists. So Michaela or Alexia, whoever wants to jump in first, um, can you give some examples from your perspective? They're working that out right now. <laughs> I like that discourse. All right, so um, from your perspective as, student, as students, can you give us a couple of examples of civic education from your experiences in Falmouth? Well, um, I'll go first. That's exciting. You both want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, for seniors, we have the senior project. So um, that's a graduation requirement. And every senior has to choose something, um, whether it be an issue or problem, that they feel strongly about within the community or even um, within the school district um, what they would rather what they would like to elaborate on or um, spread awareness for and for my senior project I focused on vocational education but mostly about the culinary program so I hope to expand it because um, because uh, right now we only offer three culinary programs and even then, um, a lot of students, like myself, don't get the opportunity to experience all of them. Um, so I am hoping to start a culinary club at Lawrence so that kids can have an experience at a younger age um, about what the high school has to offer with the culinary program and get 
a feel for what they expect to do at the high school if they hope to take culinary. So. Um, at, at Lawrence School, we have the Warrant Committee, which is made up of 12 Lawrence students, six from seventh grade, six from eighth grade. We meet every two weeks to discuss problems that are in our school or areas of improvement in the school. The Warrant Committee works on um, these as groups rather than with the entire committee. Um, we try to um, fix issues that are in the school. We have a town meeting at the end of every year uh, with two to three two, one to two students from every advisory group um, to discuss the important issues and articles that we discuss throughout the year. Uh, some things that we have improved are the uh, students uh, lockers that needed repairs or they weren't like uh, painted recently uh, to improve conservation of plastics like getting the water bottle refill, sta refill stations the uh, adding of school like dress code pant colors adding three more and uh, we're right now working on gr writing a grant to make a track for the school. Excellent. Thank you both very, very much. All right, I'm going to ask you both another question, so maybe you'll get the same response again. <laughs> so um, I think the question is going to come across a little bit differently because of your experiences and the examples you just gave us. So Michaela, I'm actually going to start with you talking from the perspective of your senior project. So you heard Mr. Feeney explain the civics project and the expectations. So can you tell us how the senior project has really made use of, of the skills and experiences that you've learned over time? Well, for the senior project, um, we have to have a total of 20 communi community service hours, 10 of which goes for planning um, everything. So, and then the other 10 is for actually doing something with our project. So for the senior project, we have an initiative plan. So we have to plan something that's going to get other people in the community involved and get, have people know what you're doing and raise awareness for it, for it and come up with a solution depending on what the issue is. Um, and at the end, we have a 15 minute presentation that we have to do based off of research that we found in the beginning of the year with our research papers that we had to write, um, as well as um, what we learned in our experience with carrying out the initiative and planning it and talking to people in the community to help us um, figure out what the best thing to do is to make it successful. So. Excellent. Thank you. So, Alexia, looking forward, you heard Mr. Feeney talk about the project for eighth graders. You're living the eighth grade experience. Michaela's just told you what happens at the high school. What are your thoughts on the future of eighth grade education with civics? Um, I feel like it'd be very helpful because I know a lot of my peers and I don't really understand the government that well, and it would be really helpful to become a part of the community rather than just listen to everything in classrooms and actually become a part of the society here in Falmouth. Fabulous. I appreciate your honesty and your answers. Thank you both. <laughs> uh, just another plug uh, for all of our seniors. When they present their senior projects, the Falmouth High School administration and staff actually seeks community members. Many of you I know have come in and volunteered your time, um, but they have a range of panelists to whom they have to answer a number of questions without the benefit of having um, peers sitting by their side. So a little, little prep for uh, Michaela, but just a plug for anybody who would be willing to join us at the high school this spring to look for that information. <coughs> All right, so the next question we're going to open up to anyone on the panel who would like to answer. How will the current student government organizations support this shift in learning? Start that one. Especially at Lawrence, um, where you heard saw the pictures of it and you heard it spoken of, we have uh, we follow directly um, the town structure. Our Warren committee is actually could be defined as selectmen, uh, and our town student town meeting is is identical actually in the same location as where the town meeting happens. Same tables. I mean the custodians ask you want the town meeting set up. Um, so 
I think it will just naturally transition as part of this curriculum to um, being, you know, it's, it's involved in the community. I'd love to see more community members involved in it. Um, the league has been involved with me in the past um, in doing it, and uh, I just see the model continuing as it is, really. So, thank you. Mr. Finney, would you like to add? Um, for the high school piece, uh, one of the things that I've been talking to some of our student government uh, representatives and class officers is they're saying we, we meet during the half days um, where we have several periods a day um, that we are able to meet on those days. And one of the things that we've been talking about slowly but surely is like, can we do something? Can we actually do a project together? Can we get together? Um, some examples of things that we did um, in the past is when this whole law was coming to be, we actually had um, students um, write their reps, um, communicate with people that were part of this law. Um, some kids were talking about the MCAS piece, some kids were talking about the civics project piece, and they were able to, uh, you know, voice whatever concerns that they have or, you know, in favor or not in favor of. Um, but one of the things that the kids are really gunning for is they want an opportunity to do something. That's, that's kind of the message that we've been getting from them. Thank you. So again, open question to anyone on the panel. What resources would best help students engage in civic learning? I'll start with that one. <laughs> uh, time. <laughs> we need the time. Um, this, this is really a, a transition for teachers and educators. Um, in the past, because when you look at social studies not being a, your traditional MCAS tested uh, subject, it's always kind of been kind of brushed aside a little bit. And now with the new frameworks, the emphasis on the civics project at both at the eighth grade and at the high school, um, one of the things that I'm hoping to see is that we get time. Um, when we want kids to do great things, we have to give them the time to do it. So I think that's something that we have to collectively come together and, and try and figure out, because that's one of the big challenges too. I'll jump on that just for a second after listening to you, Mike. Um, the, in the eighth grade, uh, I, I'm a seventh grade teacher, but watching closely um, what's ha going to be happening in eighth grade. And there seems to be a lot that's being squished in. And a lot, there's a lot of unknown at this point, which we will work through that and figure that out. But if you're looking at an MCAS and a civics project, and these kids are 14 years old, you, you know, you have a maturity issue and you have a time issue and there's, it will work, it certainly will work, but we need to like, you know, just figure out how to get it all in there. Thank you. Anyone else want to share about resources? All right. I'm actually going to jump to the next question and uh, this is Dunphy. I didn't use your maiden name this time. I'm going to direct the question at you to okay. start. Um, can you explain a bit about the role of technology in civics learning? I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, it's something that particularly the Office of Teaching and Learning and the district in general is taking a close look at um, because there are digital literacy components as well that we need to be considering as students are engaging in civic discourse, not in traditional means. They're doing it in digital spaces and they are learning, they're learning quickly and sometimes they're doing it better than um, people of older generations maybe. So uh, we're t we need to look really closely about how it can be used as an asset so that students can be, be participating in new and important ways but also that we're supporting their learning as they're doing so. Thank you, and I think it's important to point out uh, when we were unpacking the frameworks by grade, in addition to the civics attention, there's also a piece that runs parallel about media literacy um, and what students are exposed to, how they can evaluate that, and what understandings they take away from it. Um, any other panelist responses to the role of technology in civic learning? Sure. Um, when one of the things that I think is pretty exciting in regards to reference what Dr. Tellier said, um, when you look at the media literacy piece, many of our classrooms are equipped with Chromebooks 
And one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at different issues, but looking at different perspectives of different issues. And when you have a Chromebook, which is basically a laptop in front of you, you have multiple tabs open and you're looking at a situation or a news story from different media outlets and see how it's portrayed. And that's something that's really important um, for the kids to understand is how the media works. So that's it's specifically embedded into the framework. So the media literacy is really important. Um, we're at the point now, I, I kind of say to my students, I teach, I currently teach criminology. Nowadays, I find that when I'm reading about the news, I'm looking at five different sources before I figure out how I feel on something, you know, because that's, it's just kind of the way it is. Great point. So the final question that I'm going to ask of our panel um, before we open it up is about community connections. How can the community support the schools in providing civic opportunities for students? Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is with the civics project that is coming, um, we need involvement with the community. That's not going to work unless people are out there and supporting it. Um, Mike and I were actually talking today, and one of the real benefits that Lawrence has, and it's going to be eighth grade at Lawrence, is it's right over there, and downtown is right over here, and we can walk. I mean, there's no bus piece to it, anything, and if we, we could get a group of kids want to work with someone at town hall or someone it can be done very easily here and that's just such an advantageous situation for uh, for Falmouth as a town yeah we're we're really fortunate in terms of the geographical location of the eighth grade and where they are in in Falmouth where if you look at a lot of other towns and communities where their schools are located you know in conjunction to where some of their town offices are um, we're really fortunate to have um, Lawrence where it is the, the other aspect, too, is, as I read before, the, the definition of the civics projects where they can be, you know, small group, class, um, I, I think we have to be open to a lot of different possibilities. Um, we also could really use input from the folks in the town. Um, we have many people that are experts on lots of different things, um, and I think one of the things that, you know, we're also looking for is as we reach out to, to different aspects of the town, um, hopefully they're willing to, uh, you know, share some of their good ideas with us that we can kind of continue to build. Um, I think this is a process. Um, we certainly don't have everything figured out yet, um, but I think I'm excited that we, ha we have such an engaging town that we have an opportunity to do something really nice here uh, for the kids of Falmouth that will be mutually beneficial, not just for the kids, but for the town of Falmouth. Um, my whole aspect in this, when this law was, you know, in its infancy a couple years back, um, I was able to go to a conference and at the time, um, Senator Harriet Chandler basically gave a story and said, you know, we had a, a student, and again, this is Senator Ch Chandler saying, there was a kid that did a civics project in their town and they were really into solar energy. And what they ended up doing was the student petitioned this, the board of selectmen to say, can we you know, outfit some town buildings with solar panels? And the town said to the student, you know, again, the civil discourse, we can't afford to do all of them all the time the way you want to do it, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can work with our board and you can help pick the first building. And the student went through the whole process. And then at the end, it was actually the town hall that was selected. And, and I remember uh, Senator Chan saying to us, if the student stays in the town for life or leaves and comes back, they can always go back and look at what they gave back to the town. And I thought that was great. And I, and I said to myself, I really hope, you know, somehow, some way that we're able to offer that opportunity for the kids at Falmouth. Thank you. Um, that concludes the presentation that we had prepared and as you can see, you know, just as we were getting command of what the standards were demanding of us, um, we now accept the challenge of moving forward and growing those opportunities. Um, we're going to remain here for any questions that may be asked of us and then we're going to um, take our seats and listen to the, the balance of the program this evening. Thank you.
going to um, start this. We're probably going to interrupt it for two purposes. Since um, Senator Domicito is here, and I think he's, I think you said you need to leave by what is it? Eight, what time was it? Eight thirty. What? Eight thirty. Okay. So um, if we're getting a little late, we're going to give him a chance, and we have promised uh, Representative uh, Vieira no later than eight um, eight forty-five. So that's that's the, uh, the time frame here that we're working in. Hi, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, is there ongoing discussion now with town government and the school uh, department over this new civics project? Um, yes, we've, we've had some informal conversations um, in terms of hatching a, a plan. Um, and at the time, I would, I would say they're in a very beginning stage, but that was something that kind of came up right away in terms of our thought process. So, yes. Um, I'd like to add one thing. There was a meeting um, between the school committee and the, um, the Board of Selectmen, and I just happened to be sitting in there, and um, <coughs> one of our speakers was, made a presentation, and there is supposed to be a component, as was mentioned, of getting kids on, uh, students onto committees. And apparently, somebody in the state government is supposed to be disseminating something to somebody in the town. And I have been trying to find out where it is. Um, and it seemed to be coming from the voter committee, the voter portion of, of the Secretary of State's office. So I thought maybe it was Michael Palmer. I spoke to him, no. So no one knows what's happened to it. But at the meeting that I attended, several members of the Board of Selectmen thought it was really a good idea. So I think if we do some nudging here, we might be able to make that happen. I see that this has to be nonpartisan. Does that preclude your working with the Republican Town Committee and the Democratic Town Committee? Um, essentially, what Governor Baker has said in, in regards to the nonpartisan piece is it, it goes along those lines. It's they want to make sure that it's nonpartisan, and a lot of people are trying to figure out exactly you know, what that means. We're still also waiting for further clarification and information on the state level too. Um, because when, when the law first came out, there were some people looking at it saying, hey, you know, this class can maybe potentially work with this politician or this commit campaign and so on and so forth. And then when the law came out, people were discussing and saying, ooh, I don't know, maybe not um, in terms of the partisan piece. The other thing too is, when you have a, a group project, if a student elects not to be part of that group, then they break off and they can do their own thing too. So it's kind of interesting to see how that, how that will unfold. Hi, I taught a course, a required civics course, uh, a long time ago before most of you were born, when it was required in Massachusetts for every 12th grader to have it. And I'm, I'm excited by what you're talking about here, but uh, when I taught it, we were also focusing upon problems, what's called problems of democracy, problems at state level, problems at the federal level, and problems at the international level. I don't hear anything tonight about anything beyond sort of local problems. So when, when you look at the, the course itself, for example, the, the capstone, which is the eighth grade civics course, it is a Massachusetts centered um, in United States history, kind of secondary. Um, in regards to the international piece that you speak of, one new elective that we have um, launching next year at the high school is a course called Global Issues. And that's the international piece um, that we're looking at in terms of the ele at the elective level. So we understood that that was what, one of the things when the, when the frameworks came out, we were saying there's a lot of US centric. Um, what about the world? And when you look at the, the frameworks in terms of how they were disseminated, how they were created, um, the, the pendulum swung from the world toward more of a, a United States um, and also local history too. 
Uh, I have a question and a comment. Uh, my comment is based on what uh, somebody said about working on campaigns. Um, I, I wonder if a student could work on a campaign, a nonpartisan campaign, like for library trustee or planning board or something like that. Uh, and my question is about the Lawrence School um, town meeting. Um, does that, do you, do you uh, elect like the town moderator and people for the various boards and the representatives, or is it more of an open town meeting where all the students can participate? Um, sure. I have the pleasure of having our town moderator sitting at, <laughs> at my left right here. Um, and the way it works is the students, the eighth graders vote for eighth grade warrant committee members, or i.e. would be selectmen. Um, and the seventh for seventh, seventh graders for seventh, um, and they each elect six people. That election is held at, towards the beginning of the year, um, in October or so, and then um, we, uh, along the lines of selectmen, as uh, Lexi was saying, you know, they look at all of the the issues and they, you know, um, parse them down and figure out what they want to bring to the um, floor. And the floor is uh, the town meeting members or student town meeting members. Um, are elected from each individual. What we have at Lawrence are advisories, okay, along the lines of homerooms, but they're much smaller, so that the, you know it's it's an opportunity for just that small group to get to know each other. So there's one to two people from each advisory, and they become the town student town meeting members. Okay, so it's very similar to precincts. Um, so each advisory is in essence a precinct of Lawrence, but we absolutely we have 72 of them. It's a little different. So with one or two, we usually have about 110 to 125 student town meeting members who come down to the auditorium. And it's run exactly the same way as, as, um, uh, as the town meeting. One of the interesting things I was just thinking is, um, Lexi can, I mean, in, oh, and in order to choose the town moderator, the Warren Committee selects from themselves who that is. Uh, they vote on that. But they're excited initially because they get to hold the gavel. And then they find out how much work is involved. In <laughs> uh, the students who are not the representatives, then do they watch it on television? Or are they in the auditorium as well? Um, no, well, they can be brought down to the auditorium. And no, we don't actually have that ability to watch it. It's actually on channel 14. Um, but they don't, they're more interested in what the results are. You know, did they get their three colors or did it add it to their dress code pants? Hi, my name is Rosemary Carey. I'm a member of the Energy Committee and we're in. We've been wanting to get involved in civic education and I came here tonight to make contacts, but just wondering uh, for other committees or individuals who want to make a contact, what's the right channel? Um, you can reach out to the Office of Teaching and Learning, and the best way to reach us is via email, which is learning at falmouth.k12.ma.us. So it's really long, but if you go to our website, as long as you remember that the beginning part is learning, you can find the, the suffix of our email online. Um, and that will put you in direct contact with either Anna or myself to start that conversation, which is exactly how we began this conversation and planning for this evening with uh, Judy. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. I have the Iroquois speaking stick. Um, so I have a question for the two students, um, Michaela and Lexi. Um, I think one of the beauties of democracy is the ability to protest. Um, and I'm curious if any FAMA students protested on Friday for the international movement for students to stand up for climate change. Anybody in Falmouth get involved? I know you're a scientist, Lexi. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I know of. I don't think anyone in my grade or in my school really stood up or protested against climate change. I didn't for the concern uh, for climate change. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I don't know anyone who did. I'm not sure if anyone did at Falmouth High School, so. No, I'm not sure either. Oh, 
I, I might mention that we had a program earlier this year about, I think it was the gun situation, and we did have a number of students um, in the, the green, and they were running it, and they did a very, very nice job. I don't know, you know if, if either of you know who that was or who, what the group was, but at least as someone who attended, I was very impressed. My turn. Uh, some of the literature on um, uh, civic engagement points out that it's very easy to confuse service learning with civic engagement. They are very different. Uh, have you in your planning made an effort to distinguish those? Sometimes the, the uh, graduation requirement for seniors is uh, slated toward service learning. And uh, so I would like to know if you've made a, an effort to make sure that civic engagement is actually civic engagement and not service learning. Um, that's a great question. And that's actually something that we're starting that process now as we build the projects. That's what we're looking at. We're making sure that it is civic, that we're making sure that those five pieces that I had a slide about making sure it fits all those criteria, because to go back go back to your point a lot of people thought when the law first came to be oh we're gonna go down to the beach and we're gonna clean it right and of course when you look at the other components it's much more civically engaged than that so that's that's part of our process and I think that's really the the crux of the new law they want it to be civic I have a couple of questions um, and quite a few thoughts unfortunately um, one thing I would like to add to what you're talking about, in my high school many thousands of years ago, uh, that our civics course encompassed uh, what you're talking about, as well as uh, a lot of discussion about policy. Uh, the students would always get into a big, huge discussion and balance the policy, the, the good, the bad, and it was just completely nonpartisan but they dealt with policies, actual policies of the state that the state legislature was working on, as well as the federal uh, government as well. Um, they came to conclusions. They would write their arguments. We'd have big discussions, and it encompassed a great deal. The whole senior class did this in, in groups, getting together. The other thing I wanted to ask, do, do they still have boy state and girl state? They do going to the state house, becoming, uh, shadowing maybe David Vieira or, you know, uh, what did you say? It's April 5th. It's April 5th. I'm glad to know that. And also, um, the students, I assume, along the way, understand the legislative, the three legislative branches. They, they know how things are going. They're going to graduate, become voters. So they have a knowledge of what they're going to be voting on and how it, do you talk about impeachment? Do you talk about uh, different amendments and all that? So they already know that by the time they become a senior. Okay, that's good to know. I think it's great that you're doing all this, and I'm so happy to hear that, that it's, it's back in, in the real thing. Thank you very much. Music has a lot to do with, we used to do this, and tied it together because much of it is, is right, right along that long line. Oh, thank you very much. I think the whole thing, the whole project here in Falmouth is, is wonderful. Uh, I have one concern, and I sort of ask you, have about the point that a school is filled, you have a large population, I'm not quite sure about how many students there are in Falmouth High School or in seventh and eighth but are we read are you planning to somehow encompass all of them they will all go out and be citizens of this country they will not all be town moderators they will not all you know be the uh, leading the, the fray out there um, I think that's one of the problems that we have in the country is that there are so many people who just never got involved 
because the group and the people that get involved, of course, have great enthusiasm and they work very hard. If we don't really look to making sure that everybody gets knowledge of what is going on and how they should be looking at issues. So have you given thought to that in the planning of your program? Yes, um, when, you, when we look at what's changed is now there's a law that the eighth graders must, they're gonna participate in the, in the project. And so that's, that's part of the change to turn to do that. And then at the high school, there's another one but I think to, to speak true to what where you're getting at is you have to do more to get them involved. We have to do, go beyond just the scope of the law. And I think the good news is with the changing of the frameworks, you're actually now getting, social studies is getting more attention than it ever has in the last 25 years. Um, and it, it's really interesting to, to me as a department head, all of a sudden it's like, Everybody's interested, you know, um, and it's it's something that going back to your other your original question, how do you get everyone involved? That's our planning process. We're looking at designing, you know, a project that every single kid in Falmouth can be successful at, um, and depending upon the scope of the project, whether it's a class project, small group, individual, um, there's there's a lot of challenges with that. Um, but I also think your, your point's uh, well taken in terms of we're trying to, you know, create the next generations of an informed citizenry. Uh, I, I wanted to speak to that as a teacher. Um, that's what I do every day. Um, you know, I, I have a town, I had the pleasure of having Lexi last year, so I have a town moderator in my room and I have English language learners and I have all kinds of kids. And you, it, teaching no longer is just writing a plan. Teaching is writing a plan so that you reach every individual in that classroom. And, you know, that's what it is. And that's sort of, no, but it's what we do, you know. It, and I think the other piece that <clears throat> Mike called out earlier in terms of he doesn't know what to believe until he's read at least five sources. I think the other piece of that is how we're informing students and then helping them to evaluate, to figure out, you know, what can I believe? What is going to inform my beliefs? And that is part of how we have students become involved as well. I'll just say one last thing. You see, a whole lot of stuff that you learn in school. Can we have the microphone? No. I <laughs> well, yeah, Abel needs it. He can't hear oh. you. I'm sorry. I want to basically say, if now I've kind of lost what I was going to say, is that. Is that um, Why don't, we, why don't we wait on this and you'll get a surprise of age. <laughs> I, I wanted to just read one line from the law because this is a line that, um, this is a line that caught the eye of us on the committee and you've really touched on it here, especially with the, what you said about the, the computer program where you see different sources. Um, the, one of the things to learn is the development of skills to access analyze and evaluate written and digital media as it relates to history and civics. And to me, that's really the crux of the whole thing because if our citizenry can't make the judgment as to what to believe and not to believe in the world that we have now, a democracy is a very difficult thing to sustain. And I'm very glad to hear that that is one of the things that's you know being considered here. I think what I'd like to do is, um, Let's maybe do one or two more questions. Um, if Alice has a follow-up, she can do it, and then let's turn turn to. Um, this is really. There are many things that you learn in school. There are many books that you take, but civic education is something you take with you for the rest of your life. And if you don't get it when you're young, that's what's happening here in, in our country. You know, they, it seems as though many people did not get it. And so I really encourage you to keep going. Can I just make a comment being a parent at Lawrence School? So I have a seventh and eighth grader. And first of all, just from a parent's perspective, I've been very impressed about what has been brought back into my home, both when, and I will, I'll say, I'm Alexia's mother, and um, <laughs> my children, so, but I'm not a ringer, <laughs> my children have both had Mr. DC. So, 
Um, my point, though, is the fact that it's already being brought back home. There's, it's developing conversation within our house. We've had a lot of, obviously, things going on uh, in the media. It's asking the kids to look and watch the media. And as a parent, my responsibility, I feel, is to watch it with them to make sure that there is some sort of processing at home before they go back into the school and that there is processing that's happening at the school and discussion and then following up with them to make sure that everything was kind of discussed in a proper way. Um, and like I said, based off of that, I've been very impressed with how everything has been um, moving forward both last year and this year. My comment is that as we move forward, I'm very excited about the fact that it's going to be increased within the curriculum. Um, what I ask, it goes towards the time. There's so much time that's involved and so much pressure that's put on the kids in terms of all the projects and science projects and so forth that goes on. What I ask is that if there's any sort of first step process, and I know this covers eighth grade, but if there is any sort of small project that can happen in seventh grade to almost prep, in a sense, to get the wheels turning, to get them involved, even if it's a small phased project that's built into the curriculum for seventh grade, in addition to what they're already discussing in terms of current events that are in social studies. And then the second piece is for the eighth graders, if the project can actually be over space time and phased in, opposed to maybe just like a month or a month or two. If it's introduced in the beginning of the school year, phased over a period of time, and eventually grown into something bigger that's presented towards the end of the year. So it doesn't just lump in with everything else and we feel kind of rushed to get something done. I feel that we learn better over a period of time and if it's kind of implemented over, maybe it sticks a little bit longer and builds upon what everybody else is kind of saying that it gets them more fired up and interested in working and interest in the town and government. So. Um, to uh, answer your, your comment, um, one of the first conversations that I had um, with Dr. Tellier and Anna was we all three kind of talked about a sustained project long term um, because we want to make sure that that makes it more authentic. It also gives the kids an opportunity to kind of grow along with the project. Democracy kind of has bumps in the road, so to speak. As you kind of go through, things are going good on this end. Oh, you might have to make an adjustment and then keep it going. So that's definitely something that's been on our minds as we've been building this or starting to build this. I'd like to end, at least for now, the um, Q&A. I'd like to give <clears throat> the two legislators that are here a little bit of time at the microphone. And then I'd certainly be happy to continue, um, you know, if, if the panel's interested and the audience is interested, we have the room for a bit longer, so we're okay that way. But um, since, uh, Senator DiMichio, you, you have some earlier time to leave, so if you just want to um, you know, let us know if you're in favor of this yeah. question, that's very nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if I wasn't in favor, I'd be in a lot of trouble. So, uh, no, but this was something actually uh, that we discussed during the, uh, the debate about getting funding. And we did, we did want to see funding there. At the time, um, there was a lot of uh, conversation. But I ultimately believe that uh, we are going to get to the place where there's funding. Um, first, let me thank the League of Women Voters, uh, not just here in Falmouth, but uh, statewide, because they were a real push behind this happening. Um, in the uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so I really appreciate uh, their involvement and their participation, highlighting the importance of civic education. We uh, we really believe this is incredibly important, and um, there are so many aspects of this that just uh, for for me, I'm you know I'm absolutely thrilled that I came tonight to see what's going on in the Falmouth school system. I just. Uh, I can't tell you how impressed I am about the time and the effort uh, that the administration has put in, that the uh, educators have put in, and certainly the students as well. Um, that is exactly what we env envisioned. It's the legislative intent behind this. Um, and so uh, that's always nice to see when you put something uh, out and you, you know, as far as legislation and you try to go back and forth and all of the balance and pushing back and forth. Um, it, it is nice to see it come to fruition and really making a difference. And of course, 
I didn't expect less of Falmouth because it's such a civic-minded uh, community. I, you know, I, just my experience and you know, traveling around the state, this is one community that is very focused on uh, being civic-minded and working together and trying to solve problems together. So, uh, to that, I, 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 I'm, I'm incredibly impressed. To a couple of points in regards to this, is you know, I know the issue was brought up. My Donald. Good evening. The library will be closing today at 8:30. Uh, okay. What's happening? <laughs> And, and to the, to the couple of points that were brought up. Thank you, and have a good evening. No. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, to the point about being partisan and, and why we wanted it nonpartisan, I, I think just to give you a legislative intent, is because. We want people to everyone to support this, and what we found is that this was a bipartisan was a bipartisan support for this. And if it does start to become partisan, then what you're going to do is you're going to find division, and that's one of the biggest concerns um, that we wanted to. There's so many things that we can learn uh, to be civic-minded, um, but that's the reason why uh, that, that was the, the goal behind it. In regards to understanding the digital media, this is something that's fascinating for those of us um, who, I, when I started in politics 21 years ago, we didn't have all of this. We didn't have, I was excited I got a website. So, um, um, but the way it's changed in the alg algorithms and how people get information, and it's Facebook, depending on where they get the information, it becomes echo chambers. And it's really important to understand that we need to, as you said, five different sources. That's wisdom. I mean, that is because depending on where you're getting your information is, as you said, I mean, you could take one issue and have five different people writing about it and see it from very different perspectives. And so it is important to educate uh, this generation uh, to understand that, you know, where are you getting your information? For me, when I was growing up, it was Walter Cronkite and I kind of, everyone kind of felt like, you know, well, that was the news and we felt comfortable. But clearly there are bias now in, in our media outlets, that depending on where you come from. Frankly, from my perspective, I believe that that's kind of what's driving greater and greater um, this wedge that we're seeing in the, in the country. And, I, and I, that's why I'm excited about this, because I think that when we, as we educate kids to understand that there is, that this is happening, and just because what they're reading, uh, depending on their circles, it may just, it may be biased. And it's good to hear both sides of this, and I think it'll, it'll help in, in the long run. So to that extent, I, uh, I'm, I know I'm getting the hook right now, but I want to, um, <laughs> but I, I want you to know how much I appreciate being here. I, I'm, again, wanted to say, incredibly impressed with the family school system and what you're doing. So to that extent, thank you very much. And did you have a question for me? What's the difference between the school that made you go into a life of a legislator? So the question is, what civic education did I have in school growing up and it decided, made me decide to go into the legislature? And to be honest with you, not much. Um, and I, you know, as, I, as a kid growing up, it wasn't something that was um, you know, brought to me. Now, of course, now I'm in the business. I've been in so long. And of course, now, I mean, now, now it excites me. But I didn't know about it at the time. And I'm convinced that as young people know about the difference that they can make in their government, the difference that, that you know, if somebody like me can get involved and run for office and win, you know, we all can. We all, you know, I'm a first generation. I mean, actually, I wasn't even born in this country. And I've come and we've been able to participate and be part of our democracy. That's an amazing thing. I mean, we're, we are so blessed in this nation to have that ability to do that. And there's a lot of the world that doesn't know that. And we want to, to me, the, the, the concept of, I want young people to understand how fortunate they really are to live in this great nation that allows us to be a part of it, this amazing system. It's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. But the reality is, is that my vote is the same as any other person's vote. And it doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. On election day, we all have the same vote. We have one vote. And that's, a, you know, that, those, those are just powerful things to me and to educate people about, uh, and our younger generation, about how much influence they actually can have in the process is really important. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I promised um, <clears throat> yesterday, I, I promised Representative Vieira that he would have a chance to speak. Um, 
we actually have a little bit more time, but why don't we do that now? And then if we want to go back to Q&A, we can go ahead. So David. Thank you, Judy. Thank you to the league, as, as Vinnie said, not just Falmouth, but um, the statewide league. I, I served uh, right upon my election to the legislature on the civic engagement uh, commission, the Special Commission on Civic Engagement and Learning, of which a, a major participant of that was the state level league. Uh, and to my colleagues at the table to the left, uh, having uh, worked with the Lawrence School and Nancy Taylor at the time when she was principal to write the Innovation School Plan under a state statute passed in 2010, where we created uh, the student town meeting. Um, it was hearkening back to the days in the 1980s when, is Peggy Suplat with us tonight? Or is she upstairs? She's still working upstairs, huh? So where Peggy's son, Terry Suplat, and uh, Matt Malone from Mashpee and I sat down and wrote a student town meeting form of government at Falmouth High School. Uh, and so we were to be able to bring that model that we used at Falmouth High School to Lawrence through the school innovation plan. Uh, and right about the same time, some of the school committee members right remember about six years ago uh, when Thomas Moakley was a member of the, the school advisory board, the student advisory board, uh, we came to a meeting together and he talked about how um, it was time for a new form of government and they disbanded the student town meeting at Falmouth High School and went to the uh, homeroom House of Representatives and he kind of joked, but you must be upset. I said, no, didn't you read the Declaration of Independence? You know, when it's time to break those bonds and you need a new form of government, it's your deal, right? right so we'll see what happens going forward. But, um, you know, a, a few folks mentioned today about uh, when I was in school, way back when, when I taught or when I went to school, uh, we had a civics education requirement. And I just want to read a little quote of the law like, like Judy did earlier. There shall be taught in all public elementary and high schools in the Commonwealth courses in American history and civics for the purpose of promoting civic service and greater knowledge of American history and of fitting the pupils morally and intellectually for the duties of citizenship. All pupils attending said schools shall be required to take one or more of the courses herein specified at some time during their attendance at said schools. Chapter 411 of the Acts of 1920 signed by Governor Calvin Coolidge who went on to become president in 1923. This law, folks, has been on the books for years, and we have updated it time and time again. And one of the grappling things that we had on the special commission, particularly with the Board of Education, is who's enforcing the law that we wrote in 1920 and updated in the 30s and the 40s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s? What's the status of civic education? And so at the end of the special commission uh, in 2012, when we issued the report, the chairman and I, Senator Moore, who was the Senate president pro temp of, uh, of the state Senate at the time, uh, hearkening back to Horace Mann, a former Senate president who founded public education in Massachusetts on three principles, teach folks to uh, have a marketable skill to support a family, to socialize them to the values of American democracy, and to teach them citizenship to perpetuate that democracy. Those were Horace Mann's three principles. And that was what uh, Senator Moore and I carried to the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, we went there uh, at a special board meeting uh, and asked them to conduct an internal review of all of the public schools in the Commonwealth to let the legislature know, what are you doing with the laws we already passed before we go pass some new laws? And what we found was hotbeds of activity like Falmouth, and we found other schools that, well, if you were in Mrs. Smith's history class, you read the state constitution and learned about voting and maybe town meeting. But if you were in Mr. Smith's class, that may have not been part of the, part of the, the, the teaching plan, okay? So it's in the frameworks, you know, it was in the statute, but was it in the classroom? And so this law is really another attempt at us to come back, to be more specific about these engagements and the projects. You know, when, when we worked in 1992 on the Ed Reform Act, we created what we called competency determinations. Uh, everybody knows that now as MCAS, a standardized test. That was not the intent in 1992. The intent was to measure student learning. These projects have the ability to be competency determination because when we talk about civic education and civic learning, that's only 50% of our responsibility in the public school. 
The other 50% is a civic disposition. If the students leave and know every word of the Constitution, every word of the town charter, and have no interest, desire, or understanding of how to get involved and be active, we have failed. We could have had them read a comic book and learned all the words in the comic book. And so where this engagement really is important and the challenge upon educators and us outside of education supporting our educators, like folks from the Energy Committee and other town government uh, organizations, is to allow students the opportunity to touch, to kick the tires of democracy. Those of you that follow me on Facebook, first Friday in April every year, that's my post. No matter who invites me to a meeting, I go nowhere but to the legislature when the students from Falmouth, Bourne, and Mashpee come and kick the tires on democracy. As I did in 1992 when Falmouth High School sent me and I was the student clerk of the House of Representatives. My mentor, Steve James, was the second assistant house clerk. In January 2011, I arrived to be sworn in and I went up to the rostrum having voted for Steve James for clerk of the House of the Massachusetts Representative. And he goes, you're from Falmouth High School, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. Needless to say, I have had no problems with the clerk's office since. Because this was a gentleman that taught me the rules. Uh, they've changed a little bit since, but uh, taught me the rules and gave me the disposition, the civic disposition to get involved. Peter Kerwin, many of you in this room remember Peter Kerwin. One of my first engagements in civics in Falmouth was to stand on the floor of town meeting in 1992 and support with Peter Kerwin the creation of the AIDS HIV task force in Falmouth. And then I went back to Falmouth High School as the student moderator and had the warrant committee put an article on the town meeting warrant to create a student member of that committee. And we appointed a student member of that committee. In 1997, when I returned from college, I went to the recreation committee in Falmouth and asked them to put a student on the recreation committee, Sandy Cuny being the chair. And they did. They said, well, the individual can't vote because it's not allowed in the town bylaws. We don't have the structure to allow them to vote, but they can be a member, be a representative on the committee and participate. Now, over the years, sustaining student involvement in those committees and committees like the Student Advisory Board, which is listed in the statute specifically because we want to strengthen that, that's in statute already. Um, is our challenge. It's our challenge to around the dinner tables, as the, as the woman in the back of the room said, to have those conversations with our children, uh, with our friends' children, uh, and to engage them in something they're interested in. Not everybody's going to be interested in government. But all young people have interest in something. And when we can create the bridge between that interest and civic engagement and civic disposition, we fulfilled the mandate that Horace Mann made as Senate President and the charge that Calvin Coolidge signed in 1920. So to the Falmouth Public Schools, keep up the good work. I'm there with you 100%. Let me know what else you need from me. As far as the funding, uh, we're going to fight not only for the funding uh, uh, here in, in this uh, budget, but continue to work with the uh, EMK Institute, uh, who has hosted these uh, civic learning uh, arrangements, uh, conferences already. Uh, to make sure that their uh, breadth of fundraising uh, will be able to deposit funding uh, into this fund because it can accept private funds as well. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the uh, Edward uh, Kennedy Institute uh, has also uh, incorporated the Center for Civic Education. Um, and so they are a separate 501c3 as a subsidiary corporation to help us continue this work. David, could I just make a comment? Sure. May I? Um, I'm remembering back around 2003 or so, you handed a civics plan um, to two members of the school committee, uh, then school committee members, myself, and now Judge Tom Kirkman. Um, and we mulled it over, and I think we turned it back to you and said, this is great, period. <laughs> so I just want you to know, you're, you've always been ahead of your time. Yeah, and then, I w and then I went and sat at the dinner table of a former president of the League of Women Voters and pr prepared the same plan and said, maybe you guys can get it going. <laughs> and we had a great cup of coffee, but so now let's do it.
thank you very, very much. That was, that was very interesting from a town standpoint, talking about a lot of people that people know, and also from the legislative standpoint. Um, now, if we do, if anyone has any further questions, I think we have a little bit more time. If people want to leave now, um, they can. But I thank uh, <coughs> both Senator DeMacedo and Representative uh, Vieira. It's very helpful that you came, and we appreciate you speaking to us. Can we get the microphone to you, please? Um, okay. Massachusetts is a great state. It always has been. But we've got 49 other states, and how can we persuade them to do what we're doing? <laughs> um, actually, I can kind of answer that. It's one of the things that's kind of interesting is in the last three years, 37 states have gone about revising their social studies curriculum. So this is kind of a wave that's starting now. Um, and, I, and I would say that Massachusetts even didn't even finish first in this, the whole thing. We've had other states actually beat us to the punch um, with it. So this is something that's actually gaining steam nationwide in terms of the curriculum frameworks and SIGVIT's engagement. Can I add briefly? Uh, former Supreme Court let's let's do the microphone. Which has uh, been uh, allowing lesson plans uh, and some standard work with other states. So there are some national organizations that took one that are working with states to drive them towards uh, beefing up existing laws or enforcing laws that are already on. I just think our national Okay, anybody else have a question and we can yeah, yeah. I, um, I wanted to ask, do the Lawrence School and the high school have student newspapers, either paper papers or digital papers that students we, put we out? We have a digital paper at Lawrence. There's I think it would be interesting if you could incorporate the media, the newspaper, into some project or another. For example, simulating a controlled press, which wouldn't be too hard to do by the administration for a week or so and see how students react living in a place where... You're not telling them. Yeah, <laughs> uh, where the media is controlled because it is much different. And right now the media is under attack so often that I think we forget what an important part of the democracy that we have is due to a free press. And students may not realize that because they have their own their social media life. But in the, in the contained confinement of the school, point could be made somehow. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. There is some literature in the back. You'll see a little bit about the, the attempts to get the funding. And also there are a couple of copies of the law back there. If someone really wants to read the law, it's only six pages long. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everybody here, especially the students. It's such a pleasure to have both of you, the teachers, the administrators, and also our legislators. Um, and so thank you very much, and have a nice evening.